four stroke model internal combustion engine part one testing a single cylinder four stroke model aero engine that was built by my friend Andrew. The engine that's on the screen at the moment is not a single cylinder four stroke engine. It is a four cylinder four stroke engine with conventional valves. I'm very impressed by Andrew's work. To be honest, I wouldn't want to build anything like this. I recommend that you take a look at his YouTube channel the name of which is on screen at the moment. The thing that impresses me most about Andrew's work is the fact that he hasn't been a machinist for very long and only started about two years ago. And if you look at the amount of work in these parts, that is impressive. This is not the engine we're going to be working on today. This is the engine we're going to be working on today. Andrew's first attempt at an internal combustion engine this was a bit ambitious, I thought, for a first attempt, because the design uses a rotary valve system. Quite a few years ago, when I was well into radio-controlled aircraft, I had a couple of rotary valve engines made by a company called Webra. I had a Webra 91 four-stroke and a Webra 40 four-stroke, both fitted with rotary valves. And I do remember that they weren't the easiest engines to start and didn't run as well as the normal OS type. A while back this engine was in my workshop and here I'm demonstrating the point that the tank needed to be lowered. I also noticed other things, the carburettor wasn't airtight. With an internal combustion engine the inlet manifold needs to be 100% airtight. I mentioned this to Andrew and when he took the engine back he put it on his list of things to do with it. A more serious problem though was the end of the crankshaft. This really needed remanufacturing. This arrangement of an Allen bolt through the prop and two small lock nuts with washers was no good at all. I discussed this with Andrew and he put it right. Here is the engine now, sat in Andrew's workshop. I brought my electric starter, but we didn't have a power supply for it. Andrew didn't have a battery and his battery charger didn't give out enough current. This wasn't a big problem. Andrew cut a piece of wood as a chicken stick. It's called a chicken stick because you're actually chicken for not flicking the propeller over with your fingers. Despite turning the engine over with the chicken stick, it showed no signs of running. It's nowhere near, not even a pop, and the other thing is, it doesn't feel right as I turn it over. The glow clip is fully charged, and there is a little bit of fuel showing in the fuel line, but there is something very wrong with this engine, maybe more than one thing. Even at this stage, I had some theories, but felt it was a good idea not to say anything at this stage, because we first needed to just make sure that it didn't suddenly run and take us by surprise. After much flicking with the chicken stick, it didn't run at all. Time to check the glow plug. Yes, that is OK, it's glowing nicely. Glow plug engines are a bit of an anomaly. First of all, you energise the coil in the glow plug. When the compression is correct and it has fuel, then the engine starts to run and you can disconnect the battery. The heat in the cylinder from the internal combustion process keeps the element in the glow plug glowing. I know this is a simple explanation, but I am a simple man, and from the comments that I receive, so are quite a few of my viewers. At this stage, Andrew and I spoke about the valve timing, and to check this, he needed to remove the exhaust pipe. The big problem with this engine, though, is its total lack of any kind of compression. At this stage I suggested that we remove the glow plug and injected some lubricating oil into the cylinder. And guess what? When Andrew replaced the glow plug, there was still no compression. However, the engine did feel slightly different as I flicked the propeller. With the needle valve open three and a half turns, I did notice as I flicked the propeller that the fuel was trying to get into the carburettor, so that's something. At this stage we both realised that this operation was futile, so the propeller was removed and replaced with an electric drill, in an attempt to bed things in 
and see whether we got any compression, but we didn't. There's nothing else for it. The engine has to be stripped down to have a look at the internal components. Here's Andrew taking it from together. I really don't like to see Allen caphead bolts on miniature steam engines, but they do seem to be OK on miniature internal combustion engines. In no time at all, the cylinder head was detached from the main block. You can clearly see that no gaskets were used in the construction. This is due to the high quality of the machining. In this clip you can see the piston and the connecting rod. You can also see that there is a cast iron ring fitted to the piston. In this clip Andrew is undoing some more of the caphead bolts so that both the crankshaft housing and the crankshaft can be withdrawn. This part of the crankshaft has been remade and is considerably different to how it was when the engine was in my workshop. There's a clip earlier on in the video if you want to compare. In a very short while the front of the engine was withdrawn and here is the crank web on the crankshaft. The construction is very strange. I have a comprehensive collection of model aero engines, most of which were bought from John Mills of Double Boost YouTube channel fame. And none of the crankshafts and crank webs are made like this. It would appear that on all the engines I have, the crankshaft and crank web are machined from the same piece of metal. Maybe this is part of the problem, I'm really not sure. The cylinder liner is absolutely beautifully made. It's as smooth as silk. That's good, we can rule that out of the list of problems. Over now to some live audio. There are piston fits, and then there are Andrew's piston fits. I wonder why the connecting rod on this engine is so beaten up. I was going to ask Andrew about this, but I forgot. To say this ring, when it's fitted to the piston, is tight in the bore is an understatement. To digress for a moment, here is another clip showing the crank web. I really think this may be part of the problem. Although I could be wrong. Here is the piston ring fitted into the liner, and it doesn't feel tight at all. I tried the piston in the cylinder without the ring. Piston rings. As can be heard from the pop when I suddenly pull the piston out of the cylinder, it's quite a good fit. In this final clip of this first part, I connected the battery clip to the glow plug, and as you can see, it's glowing quite nicely. This concludes episode one. Stay safe, stay healthy, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Mainsteam Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.